and it was talking about the Jim Crow laws and the segregation laws and those things that were going on. And blacks were told a lot of untruths about whites. Whites were told a lot of untruths about blacks. So that kind of um, created a problem. Unfortunately, he would live in a place where he was on the wrong side of the track, so he was in kind of a white community. And uh, that gave him a, a unusual situation to deal with. White teachers didn't want a black student doing better than the white kids. Well, he had gotten to where he was making some pretty good grades, and he was up for being the top student. So the music teacher, and he was very, I can't remember what instrument he played, but very good instrumentalist. But the music teacher gave him a C, thinking that would take care of him getting the war. Wrong. Music didn't count. <laughs> so the teacher lost. He's just a minute. And that um, was kind of some of the things that he experienced. Now, when we're talking about this, you know, being born a racist, Marxists know the importance of influencing children. Lenin said, give me four years to teach children, and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. But at the same time, we can look at Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So it depends on what kind of training we want to see our kids get. And if we're paying attention, that's one of his concerns. One of the real problems we face as a society right now is preferring the opinions of experts over common sense. Now, this man has enough common sense that if you try to bring it out of him, you're going to have to have an awful big swimming pool. He reeks common sense. You read his book, and I run quiet, and you go, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, that's right, and you believe it. Uh, and chapter two, he talks about, did you take him on? No, you can have a name. Yeah, we just okay. came out. Part two, okay, fine. Well, I only like cut him one loud is kind of good. <laughs> Gary always said that when I die, they have to keep my mouth to death with a stick, and it might take two. <laughs> so when we get to that point, hold up the stick. <laughs> but anyway, uh, his theory is, yeah, we came from a common ancestor. You know, if we look at it from a Christian point of view, we go back to Adam and Eve, which we kind of like, because if we're open to the then somewhere down the road, then parts of my relatives, and that pleases me. Uh, but racial stereotyping occurs everywhere, and we need to recognize it and combat it. And it may be like he got accused of acting white because he was making good grades, he was interested in classical music, and his mom made him wear nice clothes. And they really was acting white. So, and I've heard comments from people as they're watching television wait a minute, what's going on with my basketball over because of high time on it? Like they didn't belong. So sometimes these things shift and they reverse. But we need to look at that. And then now we have, instead of Jim Crow, we have can cancel culture. And what that does, it ignores the rights of others. And now we're at the point that we ignore the rights of all new citizens, for climates. All the taxes you're paying are going to sustain them. So they're going to have money. In chapter two, he says how we look at race. And the idea of looking racist is that somebody wants to be superior. Well, if you go back, you know, you have ever tried. Somebody needs to have something over somebody, and then it goes back to long ways. And in my upbringing, I don't care whether it's the school board, the, the church board, you know, whatever group you have, the prayer board, there is always politics. There's always somebody trying to be. I was on the for a lot of years before I figured, couldn't figure out what was going on because I was always teaching school at Rexford, so I didn't always follow everything. But we always have those problems. And his theory is we can learn to get along better. We can learn to work together. We can have one side and another side and come 
together in the middle if we're willing to work at it. Well, he realized that being accused of that, he thought it was kind of silly. And he realized that hard work, vision, and determination matter more than color. Matter more whether you're a male or female. What the, out here, one of the things I learned when you're talking out here, there are certain families that are the hierarchy. You know, and then there are certain families that are almost pregnant. You know, they know. There's always, as human beings, we always have this desire. First thing to do is look at how we're different from other people than, than how we're linked. Which is not, I don't know why we pick that first. Seems kind of silly. But in chapter four, he talks about guilt and victimhood. And there is a real push to like, we should. Well, I have one side of the family and my dad's side that wouldn't even have been around in the United States when they were slavery. Now, my grandmother's side, it would have been in city and there's a chance they might have been slaves. I didn't have anything to do with that. And we have, but they want to push white milk. If you're white, you should feel milky. And if you're sensitive to that, you're a scary being. You are a better person if you feel milky if you're white. Which, when you, when you think about it, that would sound totally crazy. I'm really crazy. But they're pushing this on our college campuses. They're pushing this in our local environments. Now, out here in Western Kansas, we're not allowed to run into too many local folks. And I just had a discussion with my son. I said, well, we, we need to try to do what we can do. He said, mother, you aren't going to make a difference to all those people on the East Coast and the West Coast. I said, well, my choice is I can sit here and do nothing and complain about what's happening. I can step up and do something. If I make a difference to one kid or one person or one human being in my community, I'm on the right track. And they made a difference to one person in, in their circle and that person. So it can be expanded. It can be expanded. Um, I want to share with you. Bear with me. The political class and big techs have also become quite skilled at using guilt and shame to manipulate public opinion by convincing large numbers of white Americans that they are responsible for the plight of minorities. Irrational public policies, such as defunding the police, occur to be multiplied and magnified. Now, Victimhood allows somebody to blame somebody else for their own shortcomings. And we need to teach kids that they aren't victims. The real problem, he says, he does not believe in reparations. The real problem with reparations is it will level the economic playing field. How in the world, when there were black slave owners, when there were white slave owners, you know, and the majority of the people in the South, did not own slaves. Hmm. How do you figure out who gets the money? So he said, racism, slavery was wrong, but reparations, two wrongs don't make a right. You know, you step forward and you do something. He says it's similar to forgive and move on than it is to be easily offended and hold grudges. I mean, let's do that. I'm going to be Political correctness is a dangerous situation we're in, and it could destroy our country. And that's one of the things he warns throughout the book. He is a God fearing man, he is a Christian, but we, we better be paying attention. We can't assume somebody else can take care of things for us. And, we, and how do we get the form? My father was in the Navy Air Corps, the Army Air Corps. He was in after World War II, he was in the Air Force Reserve, and then he was in uh, a guard unit. And we, he ate supper, you know, when he came home for the same time every night, we sat down, even when we were grade school junior high, we watched the news, and our father would expect us to be able to articulate an opinion about what was going on. Now we have kids on all sorts of communication, but what are they learning from it? And then we have a, an adult that's sitting there guiding them through the discussion. And I can remember my dad told me, Linda, you don't let anybody bully anybody. And the year I was 
my junior year, and my sophomore year, he went to helicopter school in there Los Texas. And we got a little bit of a school. And there was a big, yeah, they called Moose. He's probably six, three, six, four, look like far land, but he had the worst packing you'd ever seen. And you're going, hey, don't come to here. Come to come here. So I made a point to sit out and talk to Moose every day. I thought, they're not going to come with you. I don't want to talk to you. And by the end of the summer, they sit down and talk to him too. You know, we can make a difference when we see people that are being treated poorly. And one of the things that I liked was this comment on white guilt. The first arrival of American slaves to America seems to betray that America is somehow the most evil, it's more evil than any other country that ever had slaves. We don't have to fall for that. There were lots of countries that had slaves. One of the things he talks about in leveling the playing field is simple things. Finish high school, the importance of a good, strong education. We've done a good job lately at the Libby. I'll get to that in a minute. And you get married. You have the strength of the family. And then, you wait until you're married, you have children, you plan a kid. You get a job, and by being able to have a job and take care of yourself financially, you can be independent. He says that could reduce poverty down to three percent by a study that was done by a world group, interestingly enough. He was very concerned about how we treated children during COVID. And they had to wear the mask because COVID, and I, I thought in my teaching days, you know, when I was teaching something, you watched those faces. And until those little bitty eyeballs went, oh, you didn't quit teaching. Think about how we, uh, you know, the kids making contact with people, how devastating that was, and how much harm that has been done. He also said he felt like COVID 19 uh, was the desire by the government to see how far they could control the populace by putting out mandates with no scientific backup. You know, and they got it done. They got it done. Um, he said we need to focus, however, on our successes rather than negatively trying to be divisive. We can and are being destroyed from within if we don't pay attention. Now, chapter six, and this was a big, I thought, big chapter. They talk about George Floyd at the point. Um, he said it in no way was objective coverage, what took place that day. Even though that policeman had had some bad things in his past and that hadn't been taken care of, he said uh, we, it demonized all of the law enforcement. That would be like saying, okay, we're going to demonize everybody in here because you're like racist. And that means you should, you know, you are at fault. Well, you can't have that like a sweeping uh, law. And he said, in there was a police that are individuals. You know, there was a, a policeman in the neighborhood in Baltimore that, you know, they were walking me. He knew nearly all of the people by name. He played ball with the kids in the parks. And if something was wrong, they were quick to say, hey, check this out for us. There was that trust that had been built. So there is an opportunity for us. He said in 2018, 61.5 million civilian contacts were made with police. Now, in 2019, with a similar amount, there were only two dozen civilian deaths. Now, that's way too many deaths. We don't want that. But one of the things he said were the people killed, were they resisting arrest or did they give up? Makes a difference in what comes down. And he said about all the falsehoods that got spread, you'll never be able to get those back. Uh, please, which I'm going to start over. But they do deserve our respect and cooperation. And he maybe talked about, um, there's some, okay, you guys will probably know this, there's some kind of thing they have that they can shoot it and it's done. Webbing, please. No, not a paper. This takes is some kind of plastic webbing that just that wraps around them so they can't run off. Okay, now you know, there's a but what he's saying is we can look at using non-legal methods to stop someone that's committing a crime. And
Preventatory must come to understand that when they give unconditional support to violent victims or criminals, they would actually hurt that person's chance for long term survival. Because criminal behavior that is not punished severely will only continue to grow and eventually cost the life of the perpetrator. Before demonizing a police, it might be instructive to imagine what our society would be like. Before George Floyd incident, there were hundreds of riots across the country, probably more than two million would be on a worth of damage, resulting in dozens of fatalities. People were so concerned about George Floyd, why were they looting and destroying local businesses, many of which were owned by minority many community members who had worked their entire lives to own their business? Could it be that these rioters and looters had little concern about Mr. Floyd and were just waiting for an excuse to rob others in order to gain something that they desired or unwilling to work for? Many of the rioters around the country adorned themselves in Antifa and Black Lives Matter attire and made sure they were in front of a phone or a camera of some sort. And many of them appeared to have no concern about being arrested or prosecuted. Unfortunately, in many cities that were, were victimized, leadership was more interested in defunding the police than they were in prosecuting the polluters. This will continue to be a problem until people remove irresponsible leaders from office and install office holders who actually care about the safety of their citizens and the property that has been earned with much hard labor. Now, he said, I understand that many leaders felt aggrieved by what they perceived as a systemic racist society, and they felt justified in taking what they want as a means of taking care of their grievances. If anyone, everyone follows their example, we would quickly the law in capital chaos. Therefore, these criminals should be prosecuted and at least be made to have amends for what they've done. He said, you know, he grew up his father taught him and his brother to respect police. They taught him their three sons. But he says, I realize that my failure to demonize police, some will see me as a race traitor or worse. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, I felt obligated to stick with the truth regardless of the circumstances. And he certainly does that. The uh, church has always been part. His mother was a very strong believer. And when I get into the other book, we'll get a little bit of her and her beliefs. But it is important. Uh, and big tech is an our friend. Our greatest American freedom is supposed to be freedom of speech. Have you seen that change? You know, it's changed so what we get on on TV. Now I'm seeing a few little pieces, you know, coming about. I hope more come, but as long as we allow that, the media is going to destroy our freedom of speech. Significant, significant suppression started with political correctness and has progressed to the world movement, and they're they're pushing. The power of media is also hostile churches and Christianity. They don't want any of that. You might have a moral rudder, but they can't have that going on. They can't push their agenda. So, and, but he doesn't feel like we're in quite as bad shape because he said we have made progress in black. We look at, you know, television books, uh, our basketball teams. Now, I would be sad that if you were black and your ancestors survived, coming along one of those awful slavery ships over the United States, and then your family survived slavery, you had to have better DNA than the rest of us. You don't know if that's black privilege or not, but it's exactly the way it might be. But they do seem to have the benefit of having phenomenal genetics for those things. And he felt like that we stated that we have made tremendous racial progress in America, in America in his lifetime. But now that's all being denied and all being struck under the ground. So they have, this, they have created dissatisfaction with the system that we have in order to generate enough support to change it into something else. Get everybody unhappy enough and they can slide in whenever they want. Uh, Carson, he has a very positive can do Christian attitude does not fit into systemic racism. And the left-leaning media, 
to make that. Churches and faith-to-faith communities role PCs that they should have a role so that government cannot overrule the will of the people. And we need to be noticing our internal enemies if we go about. Um, and churches, now I like this idea. Churches and all organizations need to combine forces with federal and state and local government officials. And it would be so powerful a tool that we can enhance many of our systems. But we get, well, this group doesn't, this group doesn't, if I don't get that interaction, or we don't know that somebody needs assistance because our groups aren't interacting with one another. So he thinks that uh, we should work on that. Uh, chapter 10, I want to skip over because it was, is it racism or classism? He very clearly today in our country, we have classism. Our black or president, class, that sort of thing. And what they want to have is the ruling class and the rest of it. Let them do that to us. And for the big thing is in chapter 11, education, the great equalizer. When you give someone hope, you give them the energy to pursue their dreams. And that knowledge is power. He is concerned, like I said, over the use of TV and other media for indoctrination. Yeah, but he doesn't make it his comment. I had kids from homeschooling who came to me at breakfast. And he said kids need to have a very strong sense of self and a strong moral compass. They need to be very independent in their learning. They need to be willing to learn in depth. And he said those kids usually have it. And the ones, many of the kids I got in my GT program went on to be identified with it because they had had that focus on learning. In chapter 12, he talks about path forward. And if you there was me. The founders of this country thought that it was most suitable for an educated and informed populace. Now, I got to say part of the people that got said class. They wanted society was to have good education. They clearly understood that you would not be able to continue to dominate people who were educated and who understood their rights as human beings. Now, even when I was reading the second time, when I, you can't believe that all the underlying things I'm not able to learn. Huh? Huh? It's amazing. He says that he believes we can cultivate more harmony in racial manners in our community so that we can do better. We are a diverse nation with diverse ideas. But all legal is set. Okay. All legal has two wings. It can't fly with two left wings. They can't fly with two right wings or just one left wing or one right wing. It will balance out. It takes all of us to fly. Be the, the eagle of our country. And I will end on this one. Perhaps it's time for us to harken back to when we actually believe what is written on every coin in our pocket and every bill in our wallet. In God we trust. God has favored our nation because we try to come in. Observing godly values by loving your neighbor, caring for the poor, as well as developing your God-given talents to the utmost will make us more valuable people around us. Finally, having values and principles that govern our lives will ensure not only harmony at home, but stability around the globe. The choice is ours. Now I will. Which you have a brain. And I my dad didn't use it quite that way, but he'd say, How'd that work out for you, sis? What could you have done differently? And I said, We need to be able to do that. Now he was 30 years he was brain surgeon, he did over 15,000 surgeries. But a side note, something I didn't know, your brain doesn't feel pain because there's no pain receptors in your brain. Hmm. Interesting. And one of the things he appreciates is I get up every morning, come to bed, and think big. I'm going to think big, do something. And it means his father moved out, unbeknownst to his brother, and his mother, there was another family that his father had. So his mother went to work. Sometimes two or three different jobs, and sometimes they didn't see her for two or three days. 
And then they moved to Boston to live with an aunt and uncle. Mother rented out the little property that they owned. Uh, one that dad had been told they could gamble away and turn away. And he had a cousin that he really, really liked. But guess what happens? The cousin gets shot but my, and killed. Mother spends a lot of time saying the reason that happened was he didn't make the right choices. Same thing will happen to you if you don't make the right choices. So it went on. So when he was eight and he had this experience, he uh, he wanted to ask Jesus to come into his life. He wanted Jesus to watch over him and he wanted to be a missionary doctor when he grew up. And his mom said, Benny, if you ask the Lord for something and believe he will do it, it will happen. Well, he gets the dollar and they ended up moving back to Detroit. And They had been going to a, a small church school. Unfortunately, our return to Detroit brought a problem none of us had anticipated. For two years in Boston, my third and fourth grade year, and fifth and sixth grade, he and I attended a small church sponsored school, and we were among the better students. But when we returned to Detroit schools, we found ourselves way behind our classmates, and the kids started calling him dummy. And then they decided one day, one boy said, He's the dumbest kid in the fifth grade. And then another kid like me said, Hey, Carson's the dumbest kid in the world. And he thought, no, just wait a minute. I'm somebody in the world. Yeah, there's probably somebody dumber than me. And uh, so it was, it was a problem. And all the time looking, a few weeks later, when first I received our mention grade reports, we came home from school with a report card on the kitchen table without a word to our mother. Maybe we were hoping she would be stinky, think they were trash and garbage. She didn't. No sooner did she come in the house that evening when she picked up the report card, she studied them silently, then she called for us. I figured she'd be pretty upset. The look at her mind it sounded her voice was more like sadness than anger. Boys, if you keep making grades like this, you'll spend the rest of your life sweeping a floor in a factory. And that is not what God wants for you. He gave you brains, amazing brains. He wants you to use them. She said, now I don't know what to do. She admitted, but God promises in the Bible to give wisdom to those who ask. So tonight I'm going to pray for wisdom. I'm going to ask the Lord what I need to do to help you. And her solution, you know, she said, you remember when I told you I was going to pray and ask the Lord to give me wisdom about your grades? TV's going on. You watch three TV shows a week. You're going to read two books and get different books. And then you're going to write me a report on each book. Now, the unbelievable thing about this was she could read. And she said, Betty, honey, don't you see? If you can read, you can learn just about anything. You want to know the doors of the world are wide open to you. The fact that she couldn't read was able to do that. But she worked, you know, at the maid and stuff and in upside homes, and she told the kids about it. And then he was getting along, he was doing his reading, and then comes the problem of controlling the temper. And that was not a good one. He and his friend Bob were hanging out to listen to the transistor radio, and Bob flips the channel, and he flips the channel back, and pretty soon Bob puts it back, and then he pulls out a camping knife and opens it up and stabs him. Well, fortunately, he didn't stab him. Guy had on a big belt buckle and broke, but he but he realized his temper was out of control. He spent three hours in the bathroom praying to the Lord to give him control so that it would never happen to him again. And he was able to move on. Uh, I'd been in the bathroom for three hours. When I came out, I knew God had changed my heart. After that day in the bathroom, my faith became personal and deeper, and I began reading the Bible every day and praying. Um, he had a lot of people that were mentors. He had a science teacher was trying to do a class one day and it was a mess. And science teachers finally gave up. Well, he went back in and talked to that science teacher about the experiment he was doing. And the science teacher found out, here's a kid that's interested. And he had, his, his name was Mr. Cotter, and he was a lifelong friend. So how many of you are going to be mentors to kids in our community? We have a lot of kids. I said, we used to have nuclear families. Now we have atomics. They blew up and the kids are living in the fallout. <laughs> And they're not sure where things are going to fall out or how long they're going to fall out. And they need people that can be mentors to them. He applied for a job 
had a university at the lab assistant. The guy interviewing him didn't realize he was still in high school and he got a job. And another important incident for a year. Um, on the day that Martin Luther King was killed, now the one teacher that's Mr. Dr. Potter was a science teacher because he was so interested in science. He gave you the keys to the lab and told him he could come and check on the experiments and stuff. On the day that Martin Luther King died, there were riots everywhere. And there were, he was in a, you know, blind school, but there were like five or six white people all the hall and they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. And he took the key to the lab. He let him in and hit him. He said, you know, my mom always taught me to be nice to people. He said, I think she'd be proud. So he learned to control his temper and I talked about the importance of mentors. And you know, we need mentors here. We have many mentors at the museum. Or maybe you just somebody, there was a lady who had the fourth grade, her name was Mrs. Sunset, and she would invite me up to her house and she could have this experience and fix tea and talk to me like I was an adult. Now I'm 77, nearly 78, and I remember that lady's kindness. I remember her support. I remember her being the time kind of for me to do that. So I want to challenge some of you to find that kid. Maybe there's a kid in your neighborhood. You know, I'm not too handy, but some of you guys aren't. Maybe you can show us the basic car mechanics boy or car girl. I'm not going to be segregationist about that. Or maybe you could, you know, do woodworking or something. Something where they can spend time talking to you. Because most of the kids I know spend so much time like this that they don't know how to get somebody to talk more. Now, and he does talk about pseudo ADD. We have all these kids that are like this. You've seen them. The first Thanksgiving after Gary died, I went around, I had two grandkids, and I gathered up all the phones, all the iPads, all the computers, and put them in my bedroom. So we're not doing that today. They went outside, they played with each other, they ran up down the street fight, they brought me back home, they thought I should be able to identify them, and they tried to find the national geographic of you. No, but the point is, you need to make time, because that time makes the difference. The mentors he had, it, he had an English teacher, you know, he had a math teacher, he had the college biology professor, he had all these people that took the time and invested time in him. And one of the things he found out that uh, he talks about, they were talking about, oh, my kid has ADD. No, they don't have pseudo ADD. He, he said, if they were on their phone, can they play the game? Oh, for hours. If they're watching a show that they were can, can they attend for hours? It was things in school that they couldn't attend to. And I recently had a young lady I was working with, and she came and she said, well, I'm ADD. I said, I am too. I have ADD. So what? Well, let's get to work. You know, that's not going to be an excuse to get her by. And he talked about skipping lectures, and he would read his books and read his books and read his books, and he'd add more books. And then they had people hired when he, in college, he took notes, and you could buy those notes. Then he would make sure he went to all the labs, but he didn't go to the classes. That wasn't somebody talking to him when he I learned. It was reading and rereading and repeating until he mastered things. Um, so he wants you to be aware of that. The other thing I love, I've always got these little isolated pieces of information. There is no such thing as use of knowledge. You never know what little bit of information will open a door. And we don't. And he, like I say, he talked about mentors. I like this quote. Being nice is a better way to live and its own reward. Yet seldom, you seldom make enemies by being nice. And this brought to mind a story of the, I was at a ball game, a, uh, basketball game in Goodland, and the Goodland boys were ahead, and they had a boy that you could tell the problem. I don't know what his deficits were, but the Goodland boys kept feeding, they were way ahead, they kept feeding the ball, they kept feeding, and he missed, and they feed him the ball. Right at the last, he tried to shoot like at least five times, and, and the other team realized what was going on. They knew they were beating, they kind of stepped back out of the way. But one of their team members, Tossing the ball, he shoots it and makes three points. That place went nuts. Everybody was cheering for that kid. Now, being nice doesn't take a lot of time. I take a little thought, but the impact you have on somebody when you're nice is phenomenal. And 
We have kids today that do not know how to, you know, acquire skills. They don't know how to be nice a lot of times. And when you find one of them, you better be sure we reinforce that. But we, our educational system today rarely requires in-depth learning. And we have money to down. And there was a thing on TV last night about all these millions of dollars they sent to California to beef up the kindergarten. And the kids are making more scores now. But they're wanting to push things like uh, critical race theory, that type of thing, make you feel guilty because then they can manipulate you. So we've got things to consider. And I've got one last thing to share. And if you read his book, you'll never regret it. The thing big. In fact, every element of big, big philosophy can ease, apply easily to us as a nation, as they do to us individually. T, there has never been a nation in the history of the world with the combined talents, strength, and resources that America has today. H, let's restore and maintain our nation's integrity, trustworthiness, and honesty, and revisit the values on which our country was founded. I, insight. And the reasoning power of our brains can enable us to apply wisdom and truth to our nation's problems. And if we're nice, if nothing else sticks today, I hope the end word sticks. Take ourselves out of the middle, listen to one another, so we can establish respectful dialogue with those of differing views and find common ground from which and on which we rebuild the foundation of our unity. Okay. Let's use our 21st century knowledge wisely and find common sense solutions to immigration, energy, unemployment, and a host of issues. B, if we avail ourselves of books, magazines, news, and the internet and other resources, we have better understand, we can better understand and participate in American life. I, we need to take the initiative and responsibility to do some in-depth learning, not just about celebrity pop culture, a lot of that late, but about current national and world issues and America's foundation principles in history. G, the last one and the most important one to him. We live in a country today where people are always saying, you can't talk to a lot in public. Somebody should have told me that because I don't believe it. But if a belief in God was important enough to be cited in the nation's Declaration of Independence, if under God is in our public allegiance, if the walls of the courthouse around our land, as well as every coin in our pocket, says, in God we trust, perhaps we ought to allow the lawyers to speak at least as loudly as our money. It's all right to live by God the principle, loving our fellow man, caring for our neighbor, living in service by developing and using God-given talents and resources to be a greater value to the people and nations around us. As President Ronald Reagan said in his first inaugural address, we, American people, are too great a nation to limit ourselves to small dreams. And we're too great to think small. And the only other warning I'd say is, you know, he tells us to be cautious of what we're doing, you know, for resources, for the kids, for uh, getting them information that we need to, you know, be careful of that. But this will never be a waste of time. Thank you. <laughs> you probably can read it faster than I do. He's not talking about it later, but it's a pretty good book. He talked, uh, not in these books, I haven't read all these books, but he did talk about in the one the first one, that he had a 21 year old girl that had, was having like 20, 24 seizures a day. And they ended up, he had a gun at brain on somebody that all he'd done it to children. But after he did her, they had to remove one whole half of her brain. Within a couple of years, she was back to normal, went to college, it was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And he did work with where he came to me, helping set up some medical hospitals, which went back to his dream as boy, I want to be a missionary doctor. So we need more people like him. We do, we do. But I want to challenge you to be as mentors in our community. And it doesn't have to be a big deal. It can be a little deal. We can do a little bit. We've got the time. 
you know, now I've got one foot in the grave and the other one on the other view. But I think I know it's still I have to be careful how I shoot. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you are the best. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to